Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Shifting Gears. My name is Grayson Harris. That's Whitney Cowell over there. And today we're going to be talking about something that I personally am very excited about. And I think that my co-host here cares some about. Woo! Yeah, go sports, am I right? Go team. All right. So guys, college football is officially back this week, and I'm sure most of you are just happy that you survived this long without it. But if you paid any attention during the off season, then well, you got plenty of college football news. The landscape of college football has been forever changed thanks to recent conference realignment. Uh, that stuff has been crazy. We'll touch on that just a little bit. Name, image, and likeness rights given to athletes. So athletes can now actually get paid to, you know, sign things and, and go and be in commercials, stuff they couldn't do before. And obviously, and unprecedented number of transfers now with you know players going to different schools all the time and basically uh we have free agency in college football in a way all of these things highlight really just how large the business of college football has become in 2019 the ncaa announced that the division one college athletic programs across the country totaled 15.8 billion in revenue the top 25 most valuable college football programs however they totaled nearly 3 billion that's just the top 25. There are well over 100 Division One college football programs in the nation. So while most of us, uh, me especially, are excited to watch our teams on the field, there is a whole other team of people behind the scenes that make it all possible, and they don't really get talked about that much, but without them, there is no college football, plain and simple. At least not the way that we know it. There are equipment managers who are tasked with keeping up with every piece of equipment. I'm talking every single piece of equipment that you can think of and backups for home and away games. There are nutritionists and chefs who must prepare countless meals and snacks that are specifically created to enhance these athletes' performance. And let me tell you, these boys eat. There are multi-million and in some cases at this point it's gotten close to billion dollar facilities and stadiums that are built every single year to accommodate the growth of the sport and the business, because do not get it twisted, college football is a business. It's a professional sport, for sure. The team on the football field, they're always going to get the most credit and the most mm -hmm. attention, but we believe the logistics behind these college football programs are truly impressive. So that's what's inspired this video today. and. Hope you guys enjoy it. Let's get right into it. Let's do it. I want to start with the equipment staff because I personally believe that's where most of the actual logistics happens, mm -hmm. at least in the way that most of us think of it. So perhaps the most visible of all the behind the scenes college football jobs, equipment managers are responsible for everything that the players wear, including ordering new equipment each year or each week, organizing everything in the locker rooms, loading up the trucks for home and away games, putting the stickers on the helmets. You think of it, they probably do it. A major Division One football program has hundreds, sometimes thousands, of individual pieces of equipment that must be moved and accounted for every week, every every game and every practice. So yeah, that's pretty much every day. Here's a quick look in the life of an equipment manager at the University of Alabama so that you can see how busy their everyday schedule is, even when it's not game day. And just for reference, we're probably going to be using Alabama as a reference point for a lot of this because, well, they're kind of the standard and also they've been very transparent about their process. Yeah. So it was easy to find uh, information about them. So. Shout out to the Crimson Tide. I appreciate y'all. Before each practice, the staff will load up a 26-foot box truck with everything that the team needs for the day, including pads, extra helmets, cleats, and more. It typically takes less than an hour to actually load the truck up, but it can take up to two hours to load it back up after practice. So if a typical practice lasts around two hours, then you know the equipment staff is working a total of five to six hours mm -hmm. before, during, and after each practice. And Keep in mind, the grand majority of these equipment workers are students, full-time students. Right. In the week leading up to game day, each piece of equipment has to be checked, cleaned, and repaired. And this is especially important, as you would imagine, for the helmets, since they sure. protect players' heads. You know, they're on their head. <laughs> That's where helmets go, if you're wondering. You know. If any helmet shows signs of damage or excessive wear and tear, it's replaced immediately. And that's on the equipment staff to know when it's time to get that replaced. It's not always as obvious as a you know crack down the middle of it. Once it's determined that all the helmets are safe and sound, then comes the painstaking process of putting on the stickers. Now, this is something that I didn't know we were still doing. Hand putting on the stickers. Yep. Um, that's hand yeah. stickering. H hand hand stickering. Yep. I probably could have phrased that a little better, but you know we we, <laughs> we move we move on. And we're sure that people are doing this by hand. Yeah, I've seen multiple there videos of it. There are some wild helmets out there. I pick Alabama because they're the more traditional way of doing sure. it. But at, at Oregon, for example, the logistics of just Oregon would be a video unto itself. <laughs> you know, some of those helmets are probably airbrushed. 
Actually, I know of some helmets that are hand-painted, for example. In the Navy-Army game, Navy has had some helmets in the past that were completely hand-painted, had like battleships on the side that corresponded to what division they were in. Yeah, it's insane stuff. Notre Dame, I think they still do this. It's where, like a whole video in and of itself. Oh, it really is. Notre helmets. Dame, um, they have their like gold helmets repainted every week. That's like a, a student privilege of some kind. If you've seen Rudy, it's, it's part of Rudy. You consider, I mean, with Alabama, for example, these players only have, you know, one or two helmets that they have for their entire career unless they just choose to have another one. So they're getting it restriped all the time. But thankfully, there is something that has been implemented recently in the past couple of decades that not only saves them extra work, but also saves the players unnecessary head damage in practice. Oh. Uh, these things called guardian caps, they're like big airbags that you put on the top of your your helmet. They're just basically big pads, you know, extra padding. It looks like an inside out soccer ball. It actually does a really good job of protecting all the striping too, so that's a little bit less work that they have to do. Just helmets could be its own video is kind of what we're getting at here. Uh, the equipment staff also has some control over what the players wear on game day. More control than you would think. Jerseys are actually selected by the equipment staff specifically for each game. For example, if it's gonna be a game with a lot of rain or bad weather, the staff may choose to use older, more worn-in jerseys to avoid messing up any of the newer ones. Again, at Alabama, when each player comes in, they get four jerseys. They get two of the crimson ones and then two of the white ones. And then the longer you're there, you just sort of accumulate jerseys. So if you've been there four or five years, you probably have four or five of each. If you are in a bowl game where there's a patch, you get to keep that jersey immediately. You just take it home with you. At the end of an Alabama player's career, for example, and I'm sure this happens to other schools too, but they will just send you home with a box of all your jerseys and your helmet as well. You get to keep the helmet, which I thought was, was pretty cool. You get to keep yeah. the helmet, which I guess that makes sense. You don't want a lot of used helmets out there. I'm sure there's a rule stature. about that somewhere. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so for home games, the equipment staff is tasked with loading up some of these 26-foot box trucks, and they basically move everything from the football facilities to the stadium. And, you know, that can be a drive of maybe a mile, maybe much longer. Like, you know, for example, the University of Miami, their football stadium is like not even in the same city almost as where their university is. However, the away games are always going to be a difficult process for obvious reasons. The amount of moving parts that have to be accounted for is insane. Not just equipment, but people. It's a lot of people managing. So big programs like Alabama can require multiple 53-foot drive van trailers just to move all the equipment over to the away games. Typically speaking, everything's got to be loaded up, ready to go by Wednesday for a game on Saturday, which makes sense because they're basically moving their entire locker room on right. the road. So, you know, sometimes the staff will start loading the truck at 9 a.m. and they won't be fully loaded until close to 8 p.m., a close to 12-hour process just to get this thing completely set up before they even get on the road. So those trucks will leave. They'll go straight to their destination while the players and the coaches either ride on a charter bus or they take a flight just kind of depends on the distance and right. also how much money the program has. But regardless of it being a home or away game, the equipment staff must be prepared for any and all scenarios. These guys are professional doomsday preppers, and they pretty much have to be. Every game, there's inevitably going to be somebody who forgets something. The equipment staff tries to stay prepared. They bring lists of things that players have forgotten in the past. You know, they're like, oh, I didn't think of this one. And they add it to the list, and they make sure they have it for the for the next game, but inevitably there's always something new they have to add to mm -hmm. that list. They try to stay prepared by bringing backups for absolutely everything. That includes the radio equipment for the coaches, playbooks for uh, players and also coaches, extra equipment in case some of it gets damaged or lost. The goal of every equipment staff, especially on the road, is to make sure that everything feels as normal and effortless as possible. Whoever you are lockered next to at home, you're going to be getting dressed next to you on away games as well. If you can be even remotely in the same area, they're going to make sure that happens. They have mm -hmm. the pads and the cleats and the helmets and everything set up precisely the way it would be at a, at a home game. Everything is tailored to make this as easy as possible for them, where they literally just have to show up put the stuff on and play. And in college, you know, typically each program has their own way of doing things and they just keep it very much uniform as much as possible so that, again, even when they're on the road, which with conference realignment now, that road game can be thousands of miles away. It used to be that the conferences were all somewhat geographically contained. That's not going to be the case anymore with the way the conference realignment's going. This video is not on conference realignment. I wish it was. I could talk about this all day, but oh I, you know, I would bore her to death and you know would, would probably have to answer for why I took I hijacked the podcast. 
the point is now these trips are getting longer and the logistics of it is, is going to get a lot tougher mm-hmm. and a lot more expensive. Yeah. It's not just the equipment uh, that has to be top notch, taken care of, you know, full schedule around just the helmets. Think about this, Whitney. How many calories a day do you think a Division One football player Way too many. <laughs> too many, yeah. During fall camp when they're really working out, I mean, we're talking 6,000, 8,000 calories a day. That's so much food. It's no surprise, really, that football players can put down some food. They can just absolutely well, sure. demolish a buffet. But, you know, all the time and dedication that's put into just feeding them and providing the best nutrition for performance is a pretty uh, astonishing undertaking, in my opinion. This wasn't always a priority, though. It wasn't actually until April of 2014 that the NCAA began allowing unlimited meals for scholarship athletes. Since then, food and nutrition budgets have skyrocketed across Mm -hmm. college sports. In April of 2015, just one year after the NCAA reversed their policies on the meals, over 11 schools with major athletic programs budgeted at least 600,000 for food and nutrition. And in 2016, Alabama spent over over 800,000 just on meals and snacks for the entire athletic department. The football team alone accounted for 512,656 <laughs> of that, roughly 61%. This amounts to about 6,000 per athlete just for food. And um, I'm going to make this abundantly clear. They're not eating Lunchables or ham sandwiches or ramen noodles. No, this is this is good stuff. These are super high quality meals prepared by professional chefs and nutritionists to maximize a player's performance. I mean, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to not only feed these players, but to give them the freshest ingredients possible. It's usually locally sourced. They mm-hmm. hire like extremely good chefs and teams of chefs, like 25 chefs per team some or per athletic department sometimes and you know they're being housed in these giant kitchens with some of the best equipment ever it's insane and uh, i mean you know this even includes like i said with the away games and the road games as well it's extremely in- important that you know if you have all this food and nutrition at home that you're able to carry at least some of that with you on the road so that you can stay comfortable so to do this the food and nutrition staff they prepare meals on the road and let me tell you, when I, when I say that they always have something to eat, I mean it. Like, when they get on the plane, they're being handed something. When they get off the plane, they're getting handed something. As soon as they get to the hotel, dinner. As soon as they get to their room, how about this? Late dinner s- snack. That sounds how about wonderful. Another? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just fantastic. <laughs> you were just getting uh, shoveled food 24-7, basically. This also applies to physical therapy and recovery programs. Mm-hmm. Whatever treatment or exercises the player is doing throughout the week, that's going to need to be transported to away games right. as well so no one misses a session. At some of these hotels, which, by the way, they're booking the nicest hotels because oh, they, they sure. have to. They have to get these giant you know meeting rooms and conference rooms basically no expense is spared to ensure that the players feel at home during the entire trip whether that be food physical therapy whatever the case may be now obviously though there's there's no place like home uh, especially when some of the homes are costing a lot of money Um, some of these new stadiums and facilities are breathtaking and they're not only just how nice they are but how futuristic they are they have like the nicest of everything that Mm -hmm. you can think of just for the athletic department so i know you were kind of taking a look at some of the yeah new stuff so what you got over there i found myself not looking at a lot of the newer technologies for these stadiums but when i say i fell into a rabbit hole oh here we go Looking at the history of Michigan Stadium. Oh, just Michigan. Just Michigan. It opened in 1927. Mm -hmm. The big house. Mm -hmm. It is the big house, (laughs) and it's coming up on its 100-year birthday in the next couple of years, which is exciting. At the time, it was built to hold 72,000 people. When it was built, it was originally constructed for budget purposes, scaled down with the ability to expand. So the goal all along was for it to become much bigger than it already was. And Mm -hmm. it was pre-built to withstand that kind of growth very quickly after the build. That's good foresight. The original stadium was $950,000 to build, which is, that was a lot back then. Pocket change now, but... But back then, then, that was... That was a huge investment. And then it was said to expand to 200,000 people. So yeah, yeah, right? Like they were really thinking ahead of time what it was going to hold, which is 
nothing short of remarkable. I'm just um, imagining 200,000 people to look at Jim Harbaugh coaching khaki pants. <laughs> well, as of right now, it holds 107. Thousand yeah. six hundred and one specifically. Yeah. If I'm not people. mistaken, it's the biggest stadium in college football, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, like I said, it it could still hold more. It which still is... has the infrastructure to continue holding more people, which is bananas. Mm. Where I got lost okay. in this whole story yeah. was in the building of the stadium itself. So there's a spring under the ground. Of this stadium. That seems unsafe. Yes, it was. <laughs> it, was it was massively to unsafe it? to those that were in construction. So what they ended up having to do was fill that space and lower the ground level by a significant amount, packing it down. In that process, and I think I now know why cartoons always portrayed quicksand as being terrifying, it turned into just a giant field of quicksand. Oh my gosh. While it was under construction, there was a crane that was left on site, and it was swallowed whole. So to this day, there's still a crane under the stadium. (laughs) It's still there? <laughs> Under the stadium. From what I could see, nobody went and fished it back out. Okay, so granted, you know, when I was a kid, I legitimately thought that quicksand would be a much bigger problem than it turned out to be. As it was portrayed on the cartoons, I just believe that if you left the con- confines of civilization, you would just happen upon quicksand everywhere. No, you just need to be innovative. Yeah, well, it turns out you just have to go... With architecture. ...play football <laughs> in Michigan. <laughs> bury a crane and just don't talk about it that was the early stages of what was set to be in my opinion one of the most remarkable stadiums just because of what all it housed and it was the first to pioneer a couple of things Mm -hmm. when it comes to stadium setups and one of those was in uh, 1968 it was the first stadium to use electronic scoreboards those were a lot cheaper than I thought they would be. We we're looking at $75,000 for the install of that. The initial stadium was built just out of like concrete and steel. It had wooden bleachers in 1949. Wooden bleachers? Yeah, in Ugh. 1949, God, the wooden the bleachers were replaced with steel ones. In 1956, it had a state-of-the-art press box that was installed for $700,000. So that was one of the first like elite level press boxes that we Almost saw come as on the much scene. as it cost to build the original stadium like i mean i know inflation like we're doing some numbers tricks here but that's kind of hilarious in 1968 the grass was replaced with turf at the time it was a brand called tartan turf in 1991 they said just kidding they ripped all of that up mm-hmm. they brought in eight thousand yards of sod of new grass to put back into this stadium from that project the playing surface itself because of everything that they ripped up was lowered down by three and a half feet this brought us to a total of 2.25 million dollars for that project in 2003 they said oh we missed the fake stuff yeah they they brought in and that's where field turf comes in it's a very popular brand it's used in most stadiums across the country Mm -hmm. so they redid their field turf it was still six hundred twenty thousand dollars to buy and install and haul out the grass from the stadium and to put a nice little bow on the logistics of it all and where the finances came from that install consisted of a $46,000 donation by Ford Motor Company for the crushed rubber that went into the turf oh that's healthy just playing on hot rubber you know the investment alone and this is just one stadium and the evolution of that in less than 100 years yeah and how many stadiums do we have in the u.s so well over 100 just for d1 right i mean if we count in everything a lot more than that how many cranes are we really missing not even stadiums just the football facilities where some of the practice fields are where the nutrition stuff is physical therapy stations those can get into the hundreds of millions of dollars mm-hmm. and that's not even where the people go watch the, the game it's where the players spend most of their time uh, which again i think highlights the importance of the behind the scenes stuff when it comes to well really any sport um, but i think college football especially just because you know, we get so excited for it. We, we, we think that everything that happens on the field is is very much confined to the field. And it's not. There's a whole team of people that are, you know, could be double or triple the amount of people that are on the field that mm-hmm. are actually out there making sure that everything goes smoothly from ticketing staff on game day to concessions and 
you know, the equipment staff that moves teams from place to place. Yeah. Uh, and then the chefs who have to feed these hungry, hungry boys. <laughs> these very hungry, hungry boys. So I think that stuff's it's simply incredible. We're you won't get, see football season the same this year. No, you simply will not. I promise. <laughs> now that we're kind of bringing it towards the end of the episode here, we're going to play a game. College football season is coming up, and sure everyone's real excited, uh, except for Whitney. Woo. Yeah. So we like to play this game here with Whitney where we deliberately expose how little she knows or cares about sports. So what we're going to do here today is we're going to show Whitney some college football logos and we're going to have her guess. You need to guess the school and the mascot. Okay. Okay. Based on just the logo that you see. This cannot be worse than the baseball ones. Um, well, let's find out, shall we? We're going to start here with number one. (laughs) Whitney, what is your guess on this one? (laughs) What animal is that? Badger and a raccoon mixed together. I feel like you're on the right track. So it's either, is it Wisconsin or Wyoming? It's got a W on it. The Wisconsin Badgers. Oh my God, she <laughs> nailed it. Did I really? Yep. <laughs> Moving on to the second one. What do we have here? A puma. We'll say that this puma appears in Michigan. Why not? Michigan Pumas. Oh, goodness gracious. Okay, this is the Penn State Nittany Lions. Sure. Sure. That was my next guess. (laughs) Do I know what a Nittany Lion is? Nope. Next, what do we have here? (laughs) Grumpy old man. OSU, Oregon Mm -hmm. State University, Ohio. I don't know. It's like Yosemite Sam's mean cousin. Go with Oregon State University's mean frontier man. (laughs) Now you're playing the game correctly. That's how I want you to do it. This is the Oklahoma State Cowboys. Oh, Oklahoma. Their cowboys look different than what I would have pictured. Yeah, a little grumpier. Mustache is violent. Moving on. What do we have here? <laughs> well, it's the Irish. Um, who is that? It's a bigger school. Is that for an Ivy League school? No. No? Mm-mm. The Boston Celtics. That's a that's an NBA basketball team. <laughs> Larry Bird. <laughs> we'll put them in North Carolina. They do weird things there. Irishmen, I guess. Fighting Irish. Arr. It's actually the Notre Dame fighting Irish. You were so close. I was thinking that, but I was like, oh, no. Is it Notre Dame or is it Syracuse? There's one of those like nicer. That's it's why, a, I, that's it's why a I kept looking at you trying to egg you on. It's a bigger school that I knew had a weird mascot. That's I wouldn't I have expected. That's why I kept looking at you trying to egg you on. When you said fighting Irish, I was like, she's got it. But she just has no idea. What school he belongs to. Yeah, Notre Dame. It's a pony. It. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's, you got the animal correct. Is it a type of horse, like a stallion? No, it is not a stallion. Mm. I think that's all I needed. Okay. It's a New school. Jersey horse. No. New Jersey horse. Uh, Boise State Broncos. Okay. How about this one? <laughs> that looks like Daffy Duck. <laughs> um, it's very cute. Oregon seems like they would adopt that. The yeah. Oregon Ducks. Yeah. Oregon really? Ducks. You got it. Oregon, your mascot is very cute. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that looks like a straight up Pokemon. That is not a mascot. Mm. We'll put that one as a Florida horny toad. You're, you're, again, you're close. It's Louisiana? Not necessarily. So, oh, I would have given yeah, that. Is, that is closer, though. Um, it is the Missouri? Texas Christian University mm. Horned Frogs, TCU. You did very good, Whitney. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't prepare for this quiz. I can tell. Um, well, <laughs> obviously, you're more prepared for the college football season than I anticipated. So you're much more excited about it than I thought, obviously. I am. Yeah. I'm uh, thrilled. To watch your to watch your Oregon Ducks. <laughs> yeah. I might check in on the Ducks. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Um, well, guys, that's going to be the end of the video today. Uh, hopefully, you guys got a better idea of the behind the scenes of college football, and you can kind of understand a little bit what's going on behind the scenes when you're watching college football this weekend. Um, Other than that, though, thank you guys for watching, and we will see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.